step solution to problem solving but today we will go further into each of the steps in the four step solution to problem solving beginning with step one which is understanding the problem and for each of these steps in the four step solution to problem solving I will give you some more strategies for your to help your students to solve the problems and for the first step understanding the problem additional strategies that may be used or you may ask your students to use are the following number one S Our model is R. 
that all information given in the problem are useful. Some are given for additional information only. And some information are not actually used in the solution itself but they provide hints on how to solve the problem. And in this third and last phase of the SQR model, read, you now prepare to devise a plan of solution to the problem, which is the second step in the fourth step solution to problem solving, designing a plan of solution. But before we go to that step and the strategies that they have students to decide a plan of solution, discuss first the other strategies that may be useful for step one understanding the problem. These are the prayer, vocabulary model, mnemonic devices, graphic organizers, the use of our phrase. Summarize the SQR model. S stands for survey. In this phase of the SQR model, the students read the problem rapidly, skimming to determine its nature. This is the first time the students will read the problem. And the purpose of the first reading of the problem, as I said earlier, is to get a quick general picture or overview of the problem and determine initially what the problem is about. And Q stands for question in this second phase of the SQR model. The student should decide what is being asked. In other words, the students ask the question, what is the problem in the problem? And the third phase in the SQR model, R stands for read. This is actually re-reading the problem for the purpose of identifying the details and the interrelationships evident in the problem and eliminating those unnecessary information that may be distracting and not really useful in solving the problem. That's the SQR model, one of the strategies in understanding the problems to help the students better understand a problem. Another strategy for step one to help students better understand the problem is the prayer vocabulary model. What is prayer vocabulary model? It is a concept map that helps students make relational connections between and among vocabulary words and how to make use of prayer vocabulary model the use of prayer vocabulary model takes four steps or four paces step one is identify the concept or vocabulary word step two is define the concept or word and it is better that the students define the concept the term or word in their own words step three is uh, list the attributes or characteristics of the mathematical term or word or concept 
and step four is to list or draw pictures of examples as well as non-examples of the concept or term or word. Again, the four steps in using the prayer vocabulary, vocabulary model are number one, identify the concept or word. Two, define the word or term in own words. Three, list the characteristics or attributes of the concept or word. And four, list examples and non-examples of the terms or word. This is an example of the application of prayer vocabulary model. It is a concept map. In this concept map, the mathematical term or vocabulary word identified is octagon. And is step one and that is step one, identify the term or vocabulary word. And step two is define the term or the word. And definition given here by a student is an octagon is a polygon with eight sides. And step two, list characteristics or attributes. The students have listed three attributes of an octagon. Number one, it is a closed figure. Number two, it is a simple figure, which means that it is a plain figure that can be drawn in the Cartesian plane or the rectangular coordinate system or the two-dimensional space and three it always has eight sides another characteristics which is not listed here is there are eight interior angles in an octagon and the last step in the Freyer vocabulary model is list examples and non-examples of the term or vocabulary word. One example listed here is the shape of a traffic sign with the word stop. The traffic signs are usually octagonal in shape. And there are three non-examples given in this concept map. sides which is a quadrilateral another non-example is this uh, pentagon with five sides and this uh, polygon with six sides which is a hexagon this is a concept map that illustrates the use of Freyer vocabulary model. Next strategy that is used for understanding the problem is or are the mnemonic devices. What are mnemonic devices? Mnemonic devices are strategies that both teachers and students use for them to remember a content, a concept, a list, or 
process that involves many steps. Mnemonic devices are memory aids. They serve as memory aids and they are represented by either letter strategies or acrostics. Mnemonic devices promotes recall of unfamiliar information that may include content, concept, terms, process, a list, or a sequence of steps. Mnemonic devices are classified as one letter strategies and two acrostics. Acrostics A C R O S T I C S. Letter strategies are acronyms, while acrostics are sentence mnemonics. A common example of mnemonic in mathematics is MDAS that represents the order in which operations in mathematics are to be performed. In MDAS, M stands for multiplication, D for division, A for addition, and S for subtraction. A modified version of MDAS, or I should say improved version of MDAS is PEMDAS. P E M D A S, where P stands for parentheses. This means that if an expression to be simplified contains parentheses or grouping symbols, the operations inside the parentheses or inside the grouping symbols should be performed first. And E in PEMDAS represents exponent. That is, uh, exponentiation has to be performed next after simplifying the expression inside the parentheses or grouping symbols. And then, the next operation to be performed is multiplication followed by division, addition, and finally subtraction. As I said earlier, there are two types of mnemonic devices that mathematics teachers frequently use. And these are number one, letter strategy mnemonics. Number two, sentence mnemonics, also known as acrostics. Now, what are the steps for using letter strategy mnemonic? There are four steps in using the letter strategy mnemonic. Step one, decide on the idea or ideas that students need to remember. Number two, Show the students the mnemonic that you want them to use. Step 3. Explain what each letter in the acronym or letter mnemonic stands for. And step 4. Give the students an opportunity to practice in using the mnemonic. Those are the four steps in using the letter strategy mnemonic. We have here two examples of letter strategy mnemonics. Example 1, the acronym used is the letter FIRST. 
this letter strategy mnemonic is a mnemonic device for creating mnemonics. This acronym is used for students to easily remember how to create mnemonic that they in turn will use to remember or to easily recall a content, mathematics content, a mathematical concept, a process, or a beast. In this particular example of mnemonic device, First, F stands for form a word. F is the first letter of the word form a word from your concepts or ideas. Decide if you can create a word using the first letter of each word. Example, PEMDAS. These letters P, E, M, D, A, S are the first letters of the series of operations, mathematical operations to be performed. And they are to be performed in the order that the first letter of the operations appear in this mnemonic device PEMDAS. Capital letter I in first stands for insert. Again, I is the first letter of insert and that is how you create a mnemonic device. Take the first letter of the word and see if you can create a word or an acronym be used as mnemonic device so capital I stands for insert extra letters to form a mnemonic but only insert extra letters if you need them to create a word R in the word in the mnemonic device first stands for rearrange the first letters to form a mnemonic word. Capital S in the mnemonic device first stands for shape. A sentence. If you cannot possibly create a word from the first letters of the concepts or ideas, that you want your students to remember try to form a sentence mnemonic like for example instead of using PEMDAS you can that's a, that's a letter strategy letter strategy mnemonic you may use a sentence mnemonic such as please excuse my aunt Sally and that sentence mnemonic is known as acrostic instead of PEMDAS the student may easily recall the series of operations to be performed to simplify a mathematical expression if they will use a sentence mnemonic where each letter in the acronym PENDAS would stand for a word such as the one I have given earlier. Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally where P a stands for please, E for excuse, M for my, D for dear, A for aunt, and S for Sally. And that uh, sentence mnemonic is known as acrostic. Another example of 
a letter strategy mnemonic is given in example 2 with the acronym right and this mnemonic device is a letter strategy mnemonic for solving problem that involves a formula and direct substitution of the given information or numbers into the formula and performing the operations so the first letter capital R stands for read the problem correctly or carefully and I stands for identify the information given letter D in the acronym right stands for determine the operation and unit for answering the for expressing the answer to the problem and the last letter E in the letter strategy mnemonic given by the acronym right E stands for enter this actually means substitute the numbers and calculate the answer the strategy that may be used for step one understanding the problem is the use of graphic organizers what are graphic organizers? Graphic organizers are diagrammatic illustrations designed to assist students in interpreting data, in representing patterns, and in analyzing information that are relevant to problem solving. And there are three steps in using graphic organizers. Step one, decide on the appropriate graphic organizer. You will see later on in our examples that there are different types of graphic organizers. And one organizer, one or more organizers one or more graphic organizers may be used for the same concept but one of them is more appropriate than the other for that concept so that is step one decide on the appropriate graphic organizer to use number two model for the students using a familiar concept once you have decided to use a particular graphic organizer you show to your students how to use that graphic organizer that you have selected using a concept that is familiar to your students and uh, step three Allow the students to practice using the graphic organizer independently. That is, provide them with learning activities that will allow them to make use of the graphic organizer while they work independently or on their own in that activity. Now take examples of graphic organizers. This is one example of a graphic organizer and it is known as hierarchical diagramming. These graphic organizers begin with a main topic or idea. All information related to the main idea is connected by branches, much like those found in a tree. So, a hierarchical diagramming is like 
like a tree diagram with the main idea at the top most part of the tree diagram in this particular example the the main idea is algebra and equations and inequalities are contents of the course algebra so they are below the they are in the second level of the tree diagram and in the third and lowest level of the tree diagram given you have examples of equations and inequalities the examples of equations given in this hierarchical diagramming are linear equations in one variable y and x and examples of inequalities in this particular hierarchical diagramming contain the inequality signs strictly greater than 2 and strictly less than 2. Another example of graphic organizers are sequence charts and in this diagram we have two examples of sequence charts the first sequence chart shows the steps involved in solving a linear equation in one variable x and it shows here that the first step in the sequence of steps is to add the same constant 2 to the left side and to the right hand side of the equation so in this first step instead of transposition the diagram shows that the student may use the addition property of equality by adding the same constant 2 to both sides of the equation 3x minus 2 equals 10 to obtain the resulting equation 3x equals 12 and the diagram further shows that the next step is to divide both sides of the equation 3x equals 12 by the same non-zero constant 3 to obtain the answer x equals 4 and after you have the answer the next step as indicated by the arrow from x equals 4 answer is to check if the answer obtained is correct by substituting x equals 4 into the original equation Another example of sequence chart is this uh, diagram that represents, that shows the six steps in the math problem solving processes and strategies by Dr. Marjorie Monagas in 2003. And in this uh, Math problem solving process and strategies by Monagas. The first step, as shown in the topmost part of the diagram, is read. This is for comprehension or understanding of the problem. Step two is paraphrase, restating the problem using one's own words. Three, visualize using a chart, picture, or graph. Four is hypothesis. This is to plan a solution to the problem. Five is estimate. That is, before you even actually solve the problem, you predict what the answer would be or what answer you can expect to arrive at. And the last step in this 
this math problem solving process by Dr. Managas is check check if the the answer obtained satisfies all the conditions and assumptions made in the problem. This is the third example of graphic organizer known as compare and contrast. These charts are designed to compare information across two or three groups or ideas. In this uh, particular example, a Venn diagram is to is used to compare three sets that may be given in the problem. The set of prime numbers, the set of multiples of three, and the set of numbers that are even. And uh, the Venn diagram is used to plot all the given information in this uh, diagram to isolate those numbers that are prime numbers and that are not multiples of 3 and are not even numbers and to isolate those numbers that have two attributes of being a prime number and even number at the same time and that is number two and also to show those numbers that are even numbers and at the same time they are multiples of three and those are the numbers six and twelve and also to show the number that is both if that is both prime and multiple of three and that is the number three another strategy to help students in understanding the problem is paraphrase Paraphrasing strategy is designed to help students to restate the given mathematics problems in their own words. And it is said that a student restating the given mathematics problem using his or her, or, or her own words strengthens the student comprehension or understanding of the mathematics problems and how do we use the paraphrasing strategy there are four steps in using the paraphrasing strategy step one read the problem these steps are actually for the students to to do and step one the student must read the problem Step 2, highlight or underline key terms. Step 3, restate the problem in your own words. And step 4, write the numerical sentence or mathematical sentence or equation. examples on how to apply the four steps in using the paraphrasing strategy for understanding the problem for our example one is step one is read the problem and the problem reads the middle school has 560 lockers available for the beginning of the school year they have 729 students starting school. How many lockers will they be short on the first day of school? That is the first step. Read the problem. Step 2 in paraphrasing strategy, underline or highlight key terms. 
and the key terms in this problem have been written in red to highlight them these terms are 560 lockers available 729 students starting school these two are the two important information and the word short is highlighted because that word implies that the problem the question is how many lockers are still needed by the school to accommodate all its 729 students and step three in paraphrasing strategy restate the problem in your own words and this is an example of a student restating the problem in his own word and these are the own words of the student the student rephrased the problem as if there are 729 students and only 560 lockers I need to know how much more 729 is than 560 and from this own words of the students the student now may do a step forward to write the numerical sentence or the equation from which the answer may be obtained and the equation is 729 minus 560 equals 169 Thus, 169 more lockers are needed to accommodate all the 729 students to be added to only 560 lockers available. Another example of using the paraphrasing strategy is shown in example 2. For step 1, the student will read the given problem. And the problem reads, a survey shows that 28% of 1,250 people surveyed prefer vanilla ice cream over chocolate or strawberry how many of the people surveyed prefer vanilla ice cream and step two in the paraphrasing strategy the student should underline or highlight key terms in the given problem the key terms written in red to highlight them are 28% of 1,250 and step 3 the student now restates the problem in his or her own words and this is an example of a paraphrase version of the problem if there are 1,250 students and 28% of them prefer vanilla ice cream, I need to know what 28% of 1,250 is. I also need to know that the word of means multiply. I can change 28% into a decimal or into a fraction. You notice that in step 3, as the student is paraphrasing or restating the given problem in his or her own words, he is or she is actually trying to understand the problem and uh, trying to analyze 
analyze the problem and determining what is being asked in the problem and what he or she should do to answer the problem. And finally, in step four, the student now writes the numerical sentence or equation. And one such equation is 1,250 multiplied by 0.28 equals 350 people who prefer vanilla ice cream. Note that in step 3, the student has two options to solve the problem. Either the student converts the 28% to decimal, which is 0.28 as shown in equation, the first equation, or the student converts 28% to a proper fraction. 28 over 100 as shown in the second equation 1250 multiplied by 28 over 100 that gives the same answer 350 people prefer vanilla ice cream after paraphrasing strategy the next strategy that students may use in understanding the prob problem is visualize or visualization. What is visualization? In mathematics, visualization is the process of creating representations of mathematical problems and uh, creating an image, picture, or pictorial representations of the mathematical problems help students to better understand the problem and have a clearer understanding of the problem. There are four steps in applying visualization in understanding the problem. And step one is read the problem. And step two, have the students highlight or underline the important items or images in the problem. And step three, let the students draw a visual representation of the problem and it is important that in step 3 that the teacher should ensure that students draw a visual representation of the problem and not just uh, pictures of the items mentioned or given in the problem. The last step in Visualization is to write a numerical sentence or mathematical sentence or equation from which the unknown or the required in the problem may be solved. We now take examples of how to implement visualization in understanding the problem. You can say from the examples of using visualization to help students in understanding the mathematics problem that visualization is most appropriate to use for young learners because uh, young learners have no understanding of abstract mathematical concepts and they have to see the objects either in real life or in pictures and visualization would greatly help the young learners to visualize the mathematics problems once they have seen pictures 
of the items mentioned in the problem. For one, the first step in visualization is read the problem. And the student reads the problem. There are five rabbits, two goats, and six ducks at the petting zoo. How many animals are at the petting zoo? Step 2. Have the students underline important images in the problem. The important images in the problem that the student reads in step 1 are written now in red to highlight them and these important images are five rabbits, two goats, five ducks, and how many? Third step is for the students to now draw a visual representation of the problem. It is in this step that learning mathematics can be more fun for young learners because they will actually draw five rabbits, two goats, and five ducks. And for the question how many, the operation addition represented by the symbol plus is written between two groups of animals between the groups of between the groups of five rabbits and two goats and between the groups of two goats and five ducks with the pictorial or visual representation of the problem that the student does in step 3 it should now be easier for the student to write a numerical sentence and that is now the last step or step 4 in visualization from the visual representation of the problem the student now writes five for the five ducks sorry for the five rabbits plus two for the two goats plus five for the five ducks and the student may actually get the answer by actually counting the animals shown in his or her visual representation of the problem and the answer is 12 and the student may conclude that there are 12 animals in the petting zoo for our example 2 the student again read the problem as a step 1 for visualization and the problem reads, Dave was hiking on a trail that took him to an altitude that was 15 miles below sea level. Susan hiked to an altitude that was 8 miles above Dave. What was the final altitude for Susan's hike? This problem is a problem on addition of sign numbers. And the student proceeds in using visualization with step 2. And in step 2, the student underline the important images in the problem and these important images are now written in red to highlight them and these are 15 miles below and 8 miles above in step 3 in using visualization the 
students are now asked to draw a visual representation of the problem. Dave is 15 miles below sea level and Susan is 8 miles above Dave. In the diagram that is shown, the altitude of Dave is represented by the red by the circles color colored red circles and the altitude of Susan is represented by the yellow circles the final altitude for Susan can be represented by the expression minus 15 plus 8 in the visual representation of the problem by the student, the student paired form pairs of yellow and red circles. That is, the student pair each yellow circle with a red circle. And the number of red circles that have no that are not paired or have zero pairs is taken as the altitude of Susan which is negative or minus 7 and step 4 which uh, is writing the numerical sentence which is already shown above is negative 15 plus 8 equals negative 7. Since the answer is negative 7, this means that Susan's altitude is 7 miles below sea level. Our example 3 Step 1 in visualization, read the problem. And the problem reads, Carly has $12 to spend at the grocery store. She must buy one gallon of milk and some bags of snacks. The gallon of milk costs four dollars how many bags of snacks can she buy if each bag costs two dollars and step two in visualization is have the students underline the important images in the problem that is the important given information in the problem and this information that are considered important in the given problem are now highlighted and written in red these important images in the problem are $12 to spend one gallon of milk that must buy the cost of milk four dollars the number of bags of snacks and the cost the cost of each bag of snack which is two dollars and step three in visualization ask the students to draw a visual representation of the problem and this is just one of the many possible representations of the given math problems which is a simple algebraic problem that involves a linear equation in one variable 
The student writes, I know that the cost of the milk plus the cost of the snacks equals $12. The milk cost $4. Each bag of snacks costs $2. which is $4, is represented by the four circles at the left above the horizontal line to the left of the vertical line above the horizontal line in the diagram shown. And this, four, this amount of $4 is uh, cancelled from the set of 12 circles or dots to the right and so only 8 8 circles or dots remain and uh, from these 8 dots that these 8 dots now represent the remaining 8 dollars but the cost of each bag of snap is two dollars for each bag of snap. The, the student thinks that she has to count how many two dollars she can have from eight dollars. And the answer is four. And step four in visualization is now the writing of the numerical sentence which the student can write from his visual representation of the problem. And the numerical sentence is 2x plus 4 equals 12 where X represents the number of bags of snacks that she can buy from $12. Thus, there are four bags of snacks that Carly can buy from $12. For our last example, in using visualization, for understanding the problem, step one, read the problem. And the problem reads, Tariq has two red chips, six purple chips, and two yellow chips in his bag. What fractional part of the bag of chips is red? And step two in visualization, help the students underline important images in the problem. And these important images have been highlighted and were written now in red. These important images are two red chips, six purple, two yellow. And the question asked is also highlighted. What fractional part is red? And step three in visualization, ask the students to draw a visual representation of the problem. And in this visual representation, 
of the problem by a student. The chips were represented by colored circles. And two chips are red, represented by two red circles. Six chips are purple. And two chips are yellow, represented by two yellow circles. And from this visual representation of the problem, the student can easily write the numerical. Now, in this case, it is just a, a statement, not an equation. A numerical sentence, the student will count the total number of chips in his bag represented by these 10 circles and he would count the number of red among these colored circles and the students can write that 2 out of 10 colored circles are red and he will write, the student will write that as 2 over 10. That is, the fractional part of the red chips in his bag is 2 over 10. 2 out of 10 chips in his bag are red. The next strategy for step 1 in understanding the problem is the use of learning groups in particular cooperative learning groups what is cooperative learning in cooperative learning the teacher assigns activities exercise to students and the students are grouped into several groups and students work in a group for a purpose assigned by the teacher. These activities allow students who differ in achievement, gender, race, and or ethnicity to work together and learn from each other. This means that if students work, students work in a group, they will have the opportunity to learn from others who have different experiences, who have different background, cultural background, and different, maybe different set of values and traditions as they communicate with each other towards the accomplishment or fulfillment of the work assigned to their group. Cooperative learning has positive effects on student learning as it has been shown in many researches and studies and there are five critical elements for cooperative learning groups these five critical elements are the following number one positive interdependence that is students working in a group depend on one another for the strength of one of each other and for the skills of one another to be used for accomplishing the assigned activity by the teacher number two critical element is individual accountability that is although there is an interdependence among the members of the group 
support among the members working cooperatively in a group. Each student has to have this sense of responsibility or accountability. There is still a task to be accomplished by each member of the group. And so no one in the group has to be totally dependent on others. And the third critical element is group processing. That is, every step that the group will take has to be discussed among the members of the group. That is, no one, no member of the group will take a step, uh, an action that without the knowledge of the other members of the group. Everything has to be discussed and approved by all the members of the group. And four critical element is social skills. This is very important and this is also one of the skills that is developed in cooperative learning. Students learn to communicate with others, to socialize with others as they exchange their opinions, as their they exchange ideas and opinions and they are able to express their own perspective of the same topic or concern of the group. And communication skills as well as social skills is important for the success of the group. Last critical element is face-to-face -face interaction. In working cooperatively in a group, you personally discuss things with other members of the group. That is, as you speak in a group, everyone listens and they see your mannerisms, they see your facial expression, they see your gestures, and they listen to what you say in the group. That means everything is transparent when working cooperatively in a group. Again, the five critical elements for cooperative learning are the following. Number one, positive interdependence. Number two, individual accountability. Number three, group processing. Four, social skills. And five, face-to-face -face interaction. How do you teach cooperative learning? Number one, teacher decide on the size and members, members of each group, heterogeneous group. The general rule is the more complex is the task or activity or exercise the more members there should be in each group. And one of the things that teacher has to make decision about when using cooperative learning is the size of the group or how many members there should be in each group. And the groups have to be heterogeneous. That means that not all excellent students should be in one group and not all poor performing student should be in another group. Each group should be a mixture of pupils with varying cap capabilities, abilities, and intelligence. That is, the groups have to be heterogeneous. And number two, arrange the room for teacher monitoring and student face-to-face -face interactions without disruptions to other groups. 
this means that the traditional classroom setting where all the students face the teacher in front is not appropriate for cooperative learning groups. The chairs and tables have to be rearranged inside the classroom to pave way for productive interaction among members of the groups but without distracting the other groups and uh, also to make space for free movement for the teacher to monitor the progress in each group as well as free movement for the members of the group which is necessary if they have to engage in productive interaction. Another tip for the teacher who will use cooperative learning groups is to plan instructional materials to promote positive interdependence. That is the materials that will be used for cooperative learning groups can be shared among the members of the group and the tasks that are involved in an activity assigned to each group should allow or make members of the group to work with others to accomplish the task successfully. And another tip is assign roles to ensure interdependence and accountability to each member. That means that there are tasks that should be done by all members of the group and there should also be these tasks that should be done by members of the groups would promote interdependence but personal accountability is achieved or attained when a task is assigned to individual members of the group. Hence, there are tasks that should be assigned individually to pupils or students and there should be tasks that should be accomplished by all the members of the group. Another tip is explain the academic tasks the teacher has to make it very clear what the students have to accomplish and what they should produce at the end of the activity as outcome of their collaborative learning and working in a collaborative learning group. And the directions and instructions should be very clear with the students for them to be able to do the task assigned to them. And the uh, next tip for the teacher in using cooperative learning is structure and provide feedback towards positive social skills. This is to encourage, to motivate further the students to engage in social interaction with their members, with their fellow members in a group. And the last tip for using cooperative learning is structure individual accountability. That is, each member of the group has to feel the sense of responsibility to contribute for the success of the group and not just depend entirely on the efforts of others. Each one has to make contributions, no matter how small, for the group. And that is the essence of working cooperatively in a learning group. This is an example of using cooperative learning groups where students sit in teams of four, that is each group has four members 
and the activity is evaluating algebraic expressions and each member of the team or the group has will be given an expression to evaluate and uh, these expressions are can be seen in this the lower part of the example in a box person one will or student one will evaluate 2x plus y all over 3 person 2 will evaluate 2x minus y person 3 or student 3 will evaluate 0.5x over multiplied by y and student 4 will evaluate x over quantity y over 7 for values of x and y equal to 24 and 42 respectively the teacher is the one to assign an expression to each member of the team or group each team of four gets one piece of paper and pen and it is the teacher who will assign an expression to be to be evaluated to each member of the team or group the first student will evaluate his or her expression for the given values of x and y and will think aloud as he or she works and upon completion he will pass on his uh, solution to student 2 who will check the solution and work and uh, if the answer is right student 2 praises student 1 and uh, rework and reteaches student 1 if the answer is incorrect and then student 2 will evaluate the expression assigned to him or her again thinking aloud as he or she works and upon completion he or she will pass on his answer to student 3 who will check the answer and uh, will praise the student 2 for correct answer and will do will redo the problem and teach student 2 the correct solution and the process continues until a solution all the expressions have been evaluated this activity known also as round table is good for problems with multiple steps or for generating lists this strategy that mathematics teacher can employ to help her students in understanding the problem is analyze the information how does the teacher teach her students to analyze and review the data the teacher the mathematics teacher may assign her students to work in pairs also known as learning cells each group or pair should complete the metacognitive checklist which I will show you later on and after they have checked off each stage of step one they should answer the problems asked below the checklist after answering all four questions they should be ready to move on to devising a plan to understand the problem which is step two of the four-step solution to problem solving the metacognitive chart for analyzing data this will help the students to analyze and review data and prepare them for the next step of the four-step solution to problem solving as the students complete 
each phase of the first step of the four step solution to problem solving the students put a tick or a check in the box to indicate that they have completed the phase one of step one which is read and reread if they have completed the second phase of step one paraphrase they will put a tick or check in that small box and phase three visualize and phase four is work with a group and there is a instruction here given to the students after you have checked off all four steps or phases answer the following questions what is the problem asking or what questions am I trying to answer? What information is still missing? What type of mathematical computations will I use, will I need to use to solve the problem? Does everyone in my group agree on these answers? And if everyone does not agree, be sure to write down extra responses in the space below the students are able to answer the four questions positively then they are most likely prepared for the next step